Welcome to this Sustainable Food System podcast produced by the Green Living Centre, an initiative of Inner West Council for Footprints Online. To begin with, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast was produced, the Gadigal and Wangal peoples of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. I extend this to the lands where we are recording and where people are listening from. This is and always will be Aboriginal land. It's been said that the current industrialised, conventional agricultural and food system poses serious concerns for both human and planetary health. By this we mean that it is unsustainable in its current form and that we need to address the aspects that contribute to being a carbon intensive and environmentally damaging approach. We know that there are ways to create more climate resilient food growing systems that can support the ecosystems that they exist within. Today, that is what we will explore. To do that, we are joined by three very inspiring people who understand the issues outlined and are advocates and contributors to a more sustainable food system. We are delighted they are here to share their knowledge and experiences. With us, we have Patrice Newell, Patrice is a biodynamic farmer and author of several books, with the most recent being Who's Minding the Farm in This Climate Emergency? A down-to-earth, heartfelt description of the joys and challenges of farming olives and garlic in the upper Hunter Valley in a changing climate. Welcome, Patrice. Hi there. Also with us is Emanuela Prigioni. Manu is based in the Blue Mountains and grows food in any space that comes her way including at the Littleton stores where she is the garden coordinator and is also the founder of the social enterprise Farm It Forward. Welcome, Manu. Hello. And last but no means least, needing little introduction, is ABC Gardening Australia presenter and all-round lover of plants and food growing, Costa Georgiadis. Welcome, Costa. Hi, Emma. It may surprise some people to know that the agricultural sector in Australia is the third biggest emitter of greenhouse gases after electricity generation and transport. Along with switching to renewable energy and walking or cycling more, choosing what we eat can have a real impact on our carbon footprint. So what exactly does a sustainable food system look like? In the opening chapter of your book, Patrice, you say that the whole farming system needs to do things differently. What do you see as the changes that need to happen from a large-scale farming perspective? Well, that's a very big question. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just start by saying I individually don't know the whole solution yes. that is before us because agriculture is such a diverse sector. But in Australia, it is a $61 billion industry the coal industry last year was $70 billion. So it's already less than the coal industry, although that's destined to get lower. Last year, 2019, you had the federal government um, with guidance by the Farmers Federation to claim that Australian agriculture should become a $100 billion sector. Now, what that will mean is quite a shocking thing to me. I don't support that idea because the $61 billion industry is really responsible for the destruction of the Murray-Darling Basin and the reduction in soil quality and water quality across the nation. The problems that we're having right across the country have been driven by agriculture. And so we need to really get a grip on all the micro issues that are important uh, to go forward before we start banging on about making it bigger. Okay, 70% of what Australians uh, produce, Australian agricultural sector produces, is exported. Yeah. Now, imagine 25 million citizens being perfect, absolutely being perfect in every food choice they make and every fibre choice, you know, no genetically engineered cotton for them, et cetera, et cetera. Even if we all became perfect food and fibre citizens, that's not enough to fix the agricultural sector because it is an export driven sector and the commodities that are being produced are being shipped off to produce technically junk food around the world. So you see there's the individual responsibility, but there's also a system change that's needed here, not just individual change. What might be just one or two of the key solutions that you think could start addressing this? Well, being politically tuned in to the issue, knowing a few facts is one thing, uh, to mm. 
as a call out, if you ever meet a farmer, I say, well, ask them this, do you use chemicals? Because chemicals are the great enabler of the unsustainable system. You could not grow you know, 10,000 hect 10, hectares of wheat, et cetera, without the aid of chemicals. Chemicals are the foundation and they're the great polluters in the regional sector, which then live on down, down the supply chain of the food that we're producing. So that's one important uh, question I, I think everyone who ever meets a farmer can ask. That's one thing. But the, the government um, is really driven to support big. Mm. And we saw that in the drought. You know, let's support all these farmers. You know, and in other words, we're, we're propping up a failed system. I think a lot of the propping up that happened during the drought should have come with quite a lot of conditions attached to it. You know, we want you to stay there. We can say as, as urbanites, you can say, we want you, you farmers, we love you. We want you to stay there, but we need the system. We want you to be at the forefront of that system change. And we didn't really see that because it was so horrible and ugly and sad um, it, it just became an empathy exchange. Yeah, and, and a little bit like uh, people said, well, we can't stop having that conversation now about climate change. We can't talk about system mm. change now because people are hurting. So the drought's not officially over everywhere, but it's certainly uh, changing now. And I hope that we can have that conversation. It's an important one to have. Yeah, it sure is. Costi, you travel across Australia and you've looked at different sustainable food systems. So um, what do you see the changes are that need to occur? What's your perspective? Well, look, going off what Patrice was touching on there, uh, we're in the midst of, of some dramatic changes. And the only way when you look at anything that happens in your life, um, you can't be prepared and planned for everything. Uh, sometimes you just have to like take the circumstances of the moment and say, all right, now is a window. We are in a very big window of opportunity. And whether that's coming out of the drought, coming out of COVID, um, coming out of the fires, there's been a shift. There's been a shift in public consciousness. There's been a shift in reality around those methodologies of of land management which is really exactly what patrice was speaking about our, the way we manage our land the way we choose to to uh, prioritize land use and all of this ties into that big picture um question of climate change but the moment you mention the word climate change it creates such deep-seated political polarities that often the conversations get railroaded onto, onto literal sidings, just, just little sidings of the issue and not actually allowing oxygen to, to enable the conversation to breathe. Uh, I know that there's been some really big conversations around um, the, 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 the recent fires and the commission that's gone into that and, and the, the, there's, there's room to allow new thinking and new opportunity to come in because the guards are down, the, the, the chips are down, the chips have been spent. And, and I think this is the chance particularly, and, and Patrice mentioned it, it's particularly important for, for people in the city to be clued up about this because we are the direction. A agriculture is not only serving, serving export, but it's also serving us as individuals. What we buy, propagates business. And I think we we often fail to appreciate how important our decision making is. If we keep buying imported non-seasonal produce, it will keep coming in. If it's left to rot on the supermarket shelves or if it's if it's passed on to to um, to food charities because they didn't sell it, well they're not going to keep bringing it in. That's a small action that all of us can take. But on the bigger issues, we, we really need to get informed, connect with groups that are looking at the alternatives as well, so that we have an idea of, of what's happening in regenerative agriculture, because that's a term now that is being more widely used. And, and the more we use a vocabulary, the more we use conversation, the more we put these words into our dialogue, 
the more it becomes part of the consciousness and then we can bring everyone along because these decisions won't change if everyone isn't in there helping make it happen. With all the shift that's going on, now's a chance to get that dialogue happening. Yeah, absolutely. And so this conversation we're having today is is fantastic that we can really explore some of the you know possibilities or what we see are the solutions. I have noticed Costa during COVID, we've we have seen a renewed interest and increase in people wishing to grow food at home. And and this has been growing locally, more Sydney wide and across Australia for some years now. Um, so this increase in community gardens and market gardens, you've seen it, I've seen it happening. It's really fantastic and lots of people are supporting this and being involved. What is it that you've seen, some of these models that excite you with these community organisations or in Regen Ag um, that's shaping, you know, reshaping, I guess, what, what sourcing food can look like locally? I think urban agriculture as a, as a topic is shining through in different ways and whether, whether it's in that particular renewed interest in, in food growing from people since, since the, the, the lockdown. And, and, and that was really a, a response to a realisation that how we've been marketed at, that everything's safe and sound. Well, as soon as there was one little wobble, panic sets in and things just get cleared out. And the, the reaction to that was, hey, let's go and buy seedlings. Hey, let's go and buy chickens so that we can be a bit more sustainable. People talk about sustainable, yeah. but when the fear set in, people said, well, how can I actually become that? And their reactions were, I've got to start growing food, but that wasn't going to feed the family mm -hmm. tomorrow. So the big gap there was where are we going to get the skills? And that's where there was a, a dramatic increase in viewership of in, 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 in website hits about how can I grow food? What do I do? I've bought chickens. How do I, how do I set up a coop? All of these things. And while they may seem, while they may seem small to some of the issues uh, that Patrice was talking about, but this is about creating that consciousness shift. And, and what you then had was, was people then going, oh, well, okay, I'm starting on that, but where's my food coming from? And well, now I'm looking at the labels and saying, oh, this, this, um, this asparagus is coming from Mexico and this is coming from Venezuela and this is coming from, why, why, am, I, why am I kiwi fruits coming from Italy? And, and do I really need to buy these mm -hmm. things out of, and, and, and is that food safe? You know, is it contaminated? Well, oh, hang on, where can I get local food? Where's my growers market? Why isn't my growers market open? How come I can go to a supermarket in the middle of a lockdown, but a growers market gets shut down? So, so these these dramatic times put the idea of local food in front of people. They 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 wanted to learn more. Mm -hmm. They they wanted to 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 start growing something to feel like they were having an impact. But what they were growing was an interest in the food system. And, and the big opportunity with that is we need to hold their hands and get them through to the next level. So it isn't just, oh, well, that was something that I did in COVID because, because normal was a bit abnormal, but now we're back to normal. Well, I think the essence of this conversation is that we're not going back to normal. What will the new normal be? And what, where are the windows and the opportunities for programs like Farm It Forward? How they are engaging frontline and giving people those tools. And then the crop swaps, the opportunity to, to share crops and get together and, but most of all share the skills. It's the skills that, that, that people are yearning for because what's happened culturally is that was commandeered and compost was, was, was landfilled by the supermarket era, which said, don't worry, you don't need to do that. We're gonna cover it all. But now people are, are suddenly saying, hey, hey, how can I get a little bit of control back? And this, for me, is the big chance to shift the conversation into action. And the action is happening in little ways. And those little ways are the key to introducing the big ticket conversations. Yeah, for sure. Manu, I know that you're involved in lots of urban food 
growing and have expanded that a little bit in your farm it forward model. So I'm just interested to find out from you what actually drew you to growing and how this all started for you. Uh, my story is, is is one that um, that really came from uh, a moment of crisis in my life after I'd had two my two children, uh, where I I really wondered what I could do to safeguard their not only their present but also their future. Mm. <laughs> um, and I I came very much to a big big crisis and. Um, and food growing uh, led me out of that and looking after soil uh, and all of that really got me um, out of this crisis and looking at it as an opportunity to to change my practices and also to to help others um, become empowered. It's interesting what Patrice was saying before there. I can see a correlation between this uh, mind state that we're in at the moment where we think that large scale is the solution. We think that large um, agriculture is the solution, but also large everything, large supermarkets, large. And there's a real uh, disempowerment of individuals attached to that. You know, don't worry, we've got it broad scale. You know, we can bring it to your supermarket shelf and you'll have access to it all the time. And people have realized that there's a real precariousness to that. Um, and there's, there is very little power to the individual in this kind of system. Whereas really creating a connected small scale, a connected network of small scale is much more resilient. It empowers individuals in a big, big way and they can finally take part in creating their food system as opposed to it happening elsewhere. There's an incredible, you know, um, thing that Patrice wrote, which was that the connection between farm and town is almost as much in danger as the connection between farm and supermarket. And that I find absolutely very relevant to, um, to our food system um, in general. And Farm It Forward is, is an initiative that's really bringing that food growing right under their noses. You know, I've seen the big, big paradigm shift that happens in people when they know and they see what's involved in growing you know, for instance, they, they, they can see that the tomato that they see on their supermarket shelf, that's perfectly, the, you know, kilos and kilos of tomatoes that look exactly the same mm. <laughs> and yeah. are absolutely perfect. And then they, they compare that to the tomatoes that are growing right in their backyards, you know, um, with Farm It Forward, and they all look different. They ha all have different shapes. Some of them, you know, are uglier than others, etc., etc. but they taste incredible. Um, and that's where really the difference and the, the, the paradigm shift happens when, when it's placed right under people's noses. <laughs> yeah. So there is a real potential for urban growing and peri-urban growing to initiate that paradigm shift because all of a sudden, as, as Costa was saying, um, you think, wow, you know, uh, incredible. I now realize that it takes months and months and months to grow one head of cauliflower. So why does it cost 20 cents at the supermarket? <laughs> yes. I'm exaggerating yeah. here. But, um, so it's, it, it, but you do, you become reconnected to the, the process, the process of growing, the process of looking after your soil. I mean, I remember um, right right before covid hit but people were could see that it was going to get to to become a crisis um i hosted a a, a workshop in food growing mm. and instead of i was expecting there to be one or two people because i was expecting everybody to be afraid to come and instead i had over mm. 30 people come and it was this kind of very you could feel the energy in the room that was led of course by crisis looming but it was also wow i i now realize i need to learn a different way i need to reconnect to what it means to to, to be more empowered and to be more a part of my food system which was quite exciting yeah that is exciting and as costa also mentioned it's we need to be supporting everybody that wants to keep 
growing these skills and, and moving towards a more localised food system. And so your Farm It Forward model, you know, is is a very, a very successful one. Can you just explain to us how it works and, and how it is contributing to that localised sustainable food system? Yes, so the way Farm It Forward works, we're attached to our local food cooperative, Littleton Stores Co-op. So the, the cooperative allowed us to really have a good look at what was happening in our community. So we had older people coming through the doors saying, wow, I have all this already cleared land and it's just sitting there because I'm too old to grow on it <laughs> or I'm, I don't have the mobility or I can't, I don't have time. Um, and then we also had young people coming through the doors going, it's ridiculously expensive to buy land, so I will never have access to land, but I really want to grow. I really want to, you know, I've just learnt about permaculture. I really want to look after soil. I really want to grow food locally, etc. cetera. Um, so it was really just an exercise of creating an enterprise that would link those two together. Um, the thing that transpired out of it was and relatively unexpected thing was that we were also tackling the issue of of social isolation so in our urban and suburban environments and peri-urban environments we have this issue where we we kind of live in office cubicle style (laughs) blocks Mm -hmm. um, where there is very little contact even though there is close proximity and that again there's a real opportunity Mm. there to instead of creating this kind of yes we are all independent beings you know each each one of our house blocks um is is an independent entity to go back to an interdependent system um, a system of interdependency which inherently is the way that natural systems function and that's what keeps them so stable and so um, resilient to, to, to disasters. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's like that all of us have the potential to be a producer rather than just consumers. So looking at how, how we do that in our food system is, is quite an important one. What happens is that we employ young people to mm-hmm. grow food on, on people's unused land. And in, in exchange for that, the resident that offers their land gets a weekly box of vegetables in return. Um, So it is essentially a a, a barter Mm. system. Um, But we're also in the actual monetary economy in the sense that we produce way more produce than one box of vegetables uh, often and all the excess produce is sold to our local food cooperative and to local cafes and restaurants to make a revenue for the enterprise. Fantastic. It's such a wonderful model and, you know, it's it's great to hear about it. Patrice, were you wanting to add something? I did because it's, uh, I love hearing these stories when people work within their own you know, micro ecosystem and mm. get something that can work. One of the things that I think is really interesting when we have conversations about food production, I know with Costa, it's all about, you know, how do we get the seed? How do we get the chook to lay the egg, et cetera? It's dealing with the primary production. Whereas even what Emanuela said there, in the end, you also, a lot of us become retailers as well. So it, it ends up not just being about the act of primary production, you go through a secondary if you're sending it on to a wholesaler or into a tertiary if you become, in effect, a retailer. And that's one of the interesting things. And I've found people say to me, oh, isn't it fantastic you're selling all this, unaware that I've now allocating 50% of my time as a retailer, not as the primary producer. Whereas really, we can't lose sight of the importance of that primary production component because that to me is what's being lost. If people gave focus to that, certainly in the broad acre sector, we, we wouldn't have the soil destruction that we've got on our hands now. We wouldn't have the water pollution that we've got because we wouldn't be putting in these horrible fertilizers, which then leach out into the river system and give us algae. Mm. So uh, um, it's interesting I how a food system isn't just primary production. I suppose that's just the, the obvious point because what, turns everyone on certainly in the permaculture space is the actual growing but really there's the other part of that which is the selling which is less interesting for many people 
Patrice, in your book, you say that, um, and I think Manu touched on this, there's a detachment between town and farm that's as disturbing as that between farm and supermarket. Completely. And it was so shocking during the drought to see farmers who couldn't grow, well, were not growing food. A lot of farmers do not grow their own food. It's quite mind boggling, but I'd say most don't. Mm. And it was the most tragic thing that happened for us. The slow food people down in Midland, Newcastle, mm. they actually um, came up to Gundy, up to the Upper Hunter, the riches of the Upper Hunter, and gave food parcels out. And to me, that was so symbolic of what a failed system we had. Yeah, that you know, we, here we were, the food producers, and, and people were not producing food at all, not even for their own sustainability, their own individual sustainability. So the, the, the level of breakage, if you like, uh, is so extensive that, um, and every community has to work it out for themselves because each community has unique circumstances. So one of the things for all of us that have been to sustainability conferences, you know, it's all about circles, you know, they up on the, on the thing, you've got all these circles and all the circles are interconnected. So the, mm -hmm. the new word everyone's using, the circular economy, is a good mm. thing to start using more often because we will eventually stop talking about economic growth as some linear thing because everything will be cycled, because there will be no waste, because once fossil fuels are replaced with biological alternatives, then everything will be cyclical. And so all these ideas up in the Blue Mountains and everywhere else are part of that early stage energy, that early stage development. Yeah. Because we are going to need to move towards decarbonising and I think you're right, you know, finding those connections within all of those systems is the only way that's going to see us through all of this. Patrice, I noticed you talk quite a lot about soil in your book. It's definitely a dominant theme. You write, it's first and foremost about the soil, about leaving the earth in a better condition than when we found it. And you also go on to say, organic farmers want to grow things in good soil, in living, breathing soil. And finally, that soil is our lifeblood. It needs to have a fuss made about it. So what is it about soil that's so important? Well, all great land-based food comes from good soil. When I started in ag 34 years ago, there was a soil department. You know, it's all just been, you know, given away. They're, how often do you ever hear the Minister for Ag talk about soil? You just don't <laughs> hear it. It's not part of the conversation. Yeah. And, and a lot of people say it's all about the water. You can't have good soil without the water uh, because most water out of our big river systems go towards agriculture, which is then exported. Yeah. So we... We just, it just keeps being forgotten about, not considered. Something just, just right, right in response to, um, to what uh, Patrice was just saying, which is very interesting. I'm thinking that as I started to study soil microbiology and soil health and started sharing this knowledge that I was getting uh, with people and started giving talks at different gardening groups you know the big big gardening groups in the Blue Mountains and then mm. further afield in the Central West at regenerative agriculture um, conferences I noticed that really what was happening was that the farmer had been disempowered to a to the degree that they really at the end of the day um, paradigm that they were living in that was larger organizations that were telling them that the correct way to manage their soil or to manage their land was to use chemicals, was to use this, to use that, to the, the famous, you know, putting more of things on, more on, more on, and a very, very input uh, heavy uh, form of agriculture to the point where, of course, I have trouble believing that farmers really actively went out to deplete their soils really what they did was listen which i i completely can identify with you know what do you do with if you if you want to learn well you listen to what people are saying around you you listen um to to recommendations and i i feel like 
a lot of the big, big problem was that those recommendations were coming from larger organizations that really wanted to sell products um, and really wanted to create this input dependent um, system that, that we are in, in the conventional agriculture system. Yeah, I'd like to add one thing to, to that. You're right. And everybody who is a convert to Regen who previously say it wasn't, you know, in the Regen sustainable space previously, talks about having an aha moment usually when they realise they've been conned. <laughs> One of the great things about Alex Podolinsky, who died last year, who's really the, the godfather, mm. grandfather, pioneer of biodynamics in Australia. Yeah. He was my teacher back in the 80s. He, he was a very difficult man. And besides that, he, he, he tells, he told the people in his biodynamic group a very, very important thing. And that was to trust your judgment and to not rely on experts and that you must become your own expert. You have a responsibility for this patch of land, learn about it, love it, understand it, you know, be with it through the seasons. And and that to me was one of the greatest gifts anyone could have given me back then in the 80s when I didn't know much about soil. Mm -hmm. Because he, he, it was through a network of farmers who, you know, all the conversations we have about, you know, this is doing this now, all these hundreds and hundreds of conversations that you have, was to instill in the farmer a sense of um, confidence that their judgments can be good with what they do to their land. Wow. So um, you, you're right there, Emmanuel, <laughs> yes. you know, but, but how tragic. This is the weirdest thing. People sort of knew it. They had a tap on their shoulder, but they often ignored the feeling that they had that things were not right. But anyway, hopefully yes. that will come to pass. If we, yeah. Yeah. Patrice, if we take that back further in time, when you look at the land management practices of our Indigenous past, People had responsibilities. They were passed down these observational responsibilities that they had to take on and learn. And different people, one person may have been in charge of the grasses, someone else was in charge of the water, yes. someone else was in charge of the, the, the kangaroos, someone else was, in, was, was, was empowered to look after the, 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 the birds and, and all of these things. But in, in terms of land management practice today that power of observation is what as you've said and, and Manuela you were saying that's been taken away much like the connection to food with with the consumer and the supermarket in this case the the capacity to look at the land was t is taken away in some in some sense by the expert saying well this is what you have to do but when you look at the challenges of, of fire, like having having travelled the country and spoken to, to to different people that that really understand this, there there is no. It's not just about cultural burning. It, it that's that's sort of like just cherry picking one element and saying, all right, well, we're now just going to burn with this slightly different perspective. But that cultural burning comes off the back of an understanding of the landscape and saying. Well, in the four dunes, this is the type of burning that takes place at this time. In, in, the, in the grasslands, this is what takes place there. And we understand that because in the, in the woodlands, we do it like this. And, and, and all of that learning and understanding has, as you said, Manu, come through observation and the power of observation and the people being in control of, of that. And, and bringing back a pedagogy of learning where, where we pass on information and there is no quick fix. It isn't just going to happen overnight, but these, these principal road markers are there when people take the time to move at road marker distance, not take the express train drive past and expect it to, to be delivered and as a consequence, um, undermine all of those observational powers that that differ across seasons and not just the four seasons that we talk about there's many more seasons so so yeah it, it's this it's this um disconnect which is the theme through both 
what both of you are talking about that that disconnection the 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 disengagement the placing of others in between the process as these authorized dealers and and a, and a lot of it in terms of the big ag it's it's commodification and when it's become commodified then it just marches to a totally different monetized beat which which steps outside of those those seasonal adaptations because the pressure's on and they have to get it by this time and this much because we'll only buy if there's if there's x many tons and 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 then and then all of those other other consequences roll out but then when you go to the other side and you say here's someone locally watching this tomato they're not going to cut the tomato one one centimeter up the up the the tomato and lose all that they they are going to dine on every last morsel of it and and then and then that opens up the whole thing about well there's no such thing as just emptying the crisper and saying i'll go down the supermarket and use it again it's like oh this is my broccoli I'm going to eat those stems. I'm going to eat every last bit of it. You know, I'm going to eat that eggplant. I'm going to use the leaves of the of the of the cauliflower as well because there's recipes that I can use. So, so you know, we 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 bring that observation and those skills to that next level, and we take it we take it to to the the the, the heart and away from from just just the commodity side of things. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> idea of of being your own expert is just so crucial absolutely and and trusting your own observation to see the complexities of the system that you're looking after and it's as costa was saying the that indigenous connection to country involves all of that it's it's having the connection and the engagement with your with your land that is needed in order to look after it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Patrice, in your book, you say that, you know, respecting the capacity of the land of all our different landscapes mm-hmm. is essential if we are to avoid further disaster. Mm. We see land clearing and biodiversity losses continue. So I know on your farm, you've put in place lots of different systems to, to ensure you reverse that trend. So, you know, what is it that, that needs to happen Um, on a larger scale? Well, there's been a huge amount of money that's moved into the general agricultural sector to facilitate biodiversity increase right across over the years. You may recall when Telstra or Telecom, maybe it was called then, was sold. Part of that was to save the Murray-Darling Basin. Well, even the sale of our big public asset, it wasn't enough money to save the Murray-Darling Basin. But a lot of that money went to fencing off riparian zones, for instance. Now, a very important part, we should have, you know, have to have or maximise biodiversity. During the drought, stacks and stacks of farmers just said, oh, well, you know, fenced it off, got paid for it. So government money paid for, and then they just grazed it again. So there's plenty of instances in the agricultural sector, in the regional sector, where money is given to a lot of things, but they're never followed up, they're not monitored. So to me, it's more important that it comes from individuals to trying to do a little bit at a time. You know, if you're starting an embroidery, you know, you'd start with a stitch mm. and, and, you know, maybe in the end of your life, you've finished it. Yeah. So it, it's got to be more that rather than wait for the government, I think, to pay for it. However, you've got to say the environmental disasters that have occurred across the nation, it is in the end, all of us, not regional people, but all mm, of us, absolutely, uh, that pay for the repair bill. You know, we will all pay for it. So that's why when we say there's our own little ecosystem of uh, where we create a sustainable individual life, there's that, but there's also the bigger picture as citizens of Australia who care for the, you know, the all of the nature of Australia in all its different forms. So I think if we can always just give some consideration, experience, care, that's important because that will drive political decisions to make sure it just doesn't continue as it has in the past. There is this tendency, isn't there, to um, 
to provide band-aid solutions. And I mean, it, it's definitely linked to the way that our political systems work, where really there is only enough time for, <laughs> in one term, to offer a band-aid solution. Um, whereas what we really need to do is investigate the root cause of the issue. And that was a really amazing example there with the, the fencing off of the riparian zones. Um, because, you know, is that uh, it's really managing something as a whole complex system uh, and coming up with solutions that address the root cause of the issue rather than band-aid, 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 immediate. Um, which is, it, to me, that, that issue with, you know, buying bales of straw for farmers, for instance, is very much a band-aid repair we are very happy to front that repair bill <laughs> the unsustainable management of the drought was beyond shocking to have hay from western australia trucked all across the nation to be fed to cattle that are then exported to america i mean please how could you possibly think that was a good sustainable solution it was a short-term solution to animals that were hungry but you know, it, it's certainly not one that met any of the criteria of sustainable, you know, systems. It was horrific, I thought, what was happening in the end with uh, what was being fed to animals mm. to export yeah. them. Yeah, and so are you sort of suggesting, Patrice, then, it, you know, it is going back to that first point you made about our focus being on the export industry. We have to move away from that already what we're seeing now is more and more uh, people in the cattle sector for instance in the meat sector are recognizing that they must use more grain to finish animals well we know most grain grown at the eastern side of australia is fed to animals chickens pigs and cattle and increasingly sheep now really imagine if if we increase the animal sector then that will mean more uh, more grain being fed into that animal sector. So we have the cattle people in the animal sector demanding that they meet certain specs where grain is needed for those products. So everyone who eats any meat should really give serious consideration to the quality of that meat. Meat is destined to become a very, very expensive product. And if you want grass-fed meat, the really healthy meat, then um, that will take even longer to grow in the future. So we have to get our head around accepting the prices, I think, too, that are destined to increase for the quality of these you know, complex proteins that mm. Australia produces so much of. And Costa, do you have any thoughts on that? There's a few things I was, I was thinking about just sparked by what the conversation is discussing, but I suppose my, my thoughts on it are that the reality of, of moving forward is that I think there's, there needs to be a, a, a very clear definition around what agriculture is because there's, there's agriculture to feed community and then there's agriculture mm. as a commodity and they can't mm. be cast under the same blanket because as a commodity they're 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 marching to a very different beat that people don't fully appreciate whereas as a as a local as a local and national source of sustenance well that's as much everyone's business as the commodity side is but but they they're kind of just blurred so i think i think we really need to to define clearly what urban agriculture is about, i.e. food for urban areas as opposed to food for export and what the, the controls and measures and responsibilities are because, because we, we are, as, as Manu and Patrice said, we are responsible for all of the, the national land choices that are made and the consequences of these choices are what plays out when we have these these dilemmas because because when something is is so big that it can't shift it can't move there's no modular capacity for it to 
adapt, well, then, you know, a, a drought comes or a fire comes and they're dramatically impacted, whereas smaller scale urban production is flexible. The, 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 the actual products being grown can adapt and adjust according to seasons. And that's how the majority of the world is fed. And that, that's kind of the, the thing that most people don't realise. The majority of people on the planet are fed by small scale agriculture, not by broadacre agriculture. So I asked you something there because often when I hear what you've just said, I think of fruit and vegetable. Do you see embedded in that system also legumes, enough legumes to feed people, the vegetable protein area? Because most people I know in the urban areas who may shop at farmers markets and are really conscientious food citizens, they still buy, uh, you know, their chia, their chickpeas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, from broadacre agriculture, which is not produced within an urban environment. We look at it globally, and that's what Costa is talking about. I, I completely yeah. concur. Yeah. I completely concur there, but sorry, we were bringing it back about what we can do here. Thinking that, Costa, what you're saying is really spot on about the difference between uh, agriculture as a commodity and agriculture as a um, community service, as a public service. And I, I don't think Costa meant that we should have one or the other even though systems like Farm It Forward, for instance, is run by an, a not-for-profit incorporated association, and we're about to become a registered charity. So essentially, our food growing practices are a public service. They're considered a public service, which is quite interesting because I have many friends who are farmers and are competing, even small-scale farmers, but you know, sort of medium scale farmers that are competing with the commodity agriculture sector because they're in that system that is running a farm like a private service, like a, like a, a private company. So there are two different things and I think we should definitely have a good balance of both of those things. Definitely for us shifting our mind towards agriculture, food growing, not just being a commodity and a something that we need to outsource out to broad scale and to, you know, everything will have to be grown. All of our meat, for instance, um, or all of our, depending on which meat, of course, we're talking about, we've talked about cattle, but we haven't spoken about poultry, for instance. I just want to give it a quick example. One of our farmers, young farmers that are paid um, as part of Farm It Forward, was just telling me just this morning that he, he is on a, quite a small income and he was saying, wow, because of being a part of this, I barely have to pay for any of my food. I get eggs from Alex, one of our residents. I get um, I get mushrooms, Fla, who's growing mushrooms in their backyard. I get my vegetables, and I get you know I get bread from the dumpster because I go dumpster diving and get all the bread that's being thrown out at the end of the day. And so I, you know, and I find that quite interesting. It's really young people have shifted to thinking, wow, there's a lot of wastage, how do I respond to that? And if I am connected enough, I am able to source and to, to be part of this interdependent system where I, I can be looked after. So yeah, I, I find that quite interesting and, and absolutely spot on, that difference. We, we never differentiate between agriculture, that, that part of agriculture that is commodity agriculture. I can tell you that over the drought and during the drought and the bushfires, I felt a little bit guilty because Farm It Forward was thriving. We had, um, you know, we had soil that we had looked after, we had built soil, so even the floods and the drought, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, were not giving us much, many issues. We were growing plenty of food, getting plenty of money from the government because we are not for profit, um, not just from the government, but also from our local local uh, cooperative and local businesses that were supporting us. Whereas farmers, 
the same farmers, friends of mine who were medium scale farmers were getting nothing. The organic farmers, the regenerative farmers that were doing it all right, were not getting any help from anybody. <laughs> and there is, there is that big issue where we don't regard food growing as, as, as a public service. Um, and we should. I, I'd like to leave this as a thought. Imagine the existing system changing. All the rural supply shops that make most of their money selling, you know, genetically engineered seed stock or chemicals are no, not there anymore. So what are they selling? They're very much part of the economy of most regional towns. So, you know, it is quite a revolutionary change will take place. And it's slightly scary because we all want regional towns to be a thriving places. I mean, I'd hate to think that I could drive up to Mount Isa and not pass through country towns. But clearly, I can't see that it will be allowed to increase at the scale that the federal government wants it to at the $100 billion mark, because you have to have the water and the soil improving and more balanced that can go forward. Um, I know I am a little bit myself negative about export. I say it's the nation's soil and water. The focus should not be export. Mm. Of course, from a government point of view, it actually is because it's what gives us income. And it's certainly what props up most of regional Australia. But if that is the case, then we're going to need a lot more interaction with urban people visiting regional centres more than ever, I think, to sustain that. So it's a, I think, you know, we are about to have a revolutionary, you know, we're on the cusp of something revolutionary, I think. And I don't quite know where it will go. I don't know if I'll live, hope to be around for a few more years. But, you know, it, and systems change always takes time. But if we are to do agriculture that is not greenhouse gas emitting, all those chemicals, all those horrible fertilisers, they are going to be out the door. We will not be able to use them, I think, to, to prop up the system we've got today because they are bad. The machinery we're using, every time we put a plough on the ground, we're potentially emitting greenhouse gas. So, you know, all those small decisions that we're making, uh, you know, there's a lot of small changes from everyone, from a garden to, to a broad acre. Mm. And we're, what we value as a nation, what we value. Yeah, I, I found it really, really incredible because we are at that crisis point where people are coming to the party that would not have otherwise five years ago. So um, the, the regenerative agriculture conferences that I've attended in the last six months have been really eye-opening because there are farmers there who would not have been there five years ago uh, listening and going, yep, I can't keep going like this. Um, practices need to change. Uh, definitely being a offering some kind of incentive for farmers to do reverse that cycle and store carbon in their soil and being maybe somehow remunerated for that carbon i think it's happening in western australia and in other places but for that carbon that they are able to sequester so you know the problem is really very much the solution here but, but then it gets back to it's all about the money yeah. Whereas what we should be driven, it's like being kind to people. It's like being honest to people. We should be doing it anyway. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. see. You know, it's, it's beca it, beca it became so politicised and, and then you just have these camps that have been, been, been concertedly destructive because there's not a belief that there's a problem. So if there's no belief that there's a problem, then anyone as you saw maybe seven years ago, eight years ago, saying this will be the carbon, the carbon farming opportunity around 2010, 2011. I, I, I was engaged with people that were in conversations to get that as part of, of an actual produce. That's, that's actually part of farming the land was to produce carbon. This very quantifiable carbon. But then you, you have, political decisions and a political um, um, exit, you know, there was an exit taken that said, no, we're not going to do any of that. And so now we're, 
we're sort of eight to 10 years That's down the track right. and the urgency yeah. has now shifted and and that that thinking and those those actual mechanisms that were there and ready to go um, have to be well you know are being dusted off and I think the places where they've first been dusted off as you've said is the fact that 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 the people on the ground are actually reaching out because they're going these conditions are not getting any better and because of that that that's driving it but we we need the parallel um transmission we, we need we need two transmissions in this vehicle we need it on the ground but we need it at all of those all of those uh political levels as well to say this can be achieved because we're backing you because we now see the consequences of what's happening and they are bigger bigger than ever before and you will not be living in the world and living off a fat of a land that isn't there anymore we've we've drawn the account down um, there, there's no money to come out. There's no and and that, that whole idea of 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 the of the soil carbon that's that's the bank account and um, that that's got to be part of, of 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 a vision moving moving forward. And I think every every um, everyone involved in the sector knows that. But it's now a case of bringing bringing the political um, not persuasion but action to the table. And and now, really, that's that that that's the that's the yeah, bottom line. And also creating creating enterprises that can help in that transition point. So, you know, thinking of Farm It Forward, for instance, as you know, yes, we're not going to go from the way we function, getting thing everything from the supermarket to having a home economy where everybody works from home and grows food in their backyards, et cetera, et cetera, from one day to the other. So how do we create an enterprise yeah. to, to transition? Um, and, and that's hugely important because we can get stuck a little bit in, yep, this is the ideal world that we need to create but then also get this real opportunity for creative thinking to come up with enterprises that will help us transition to where we want to go. And that's not going to be perfect. We're not going to be um, only in the, uh, the public service agriculture or, and moving completely away from the commodity agriculture. We will have to participate in the monetary economy so that the economy doesn't crash, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so just creative solutions to transition, to, tr to help us transition. Yeah, and we see a lot of examples of that. And obviously, as you said, Farm It Forward is one, one way and one model. And I, I have to say, as a gardener myself, I do think of, you know, planting a garden, um, in particular growing food, as as a metaphor for hope, really, you know, we, we build soil, we plant seeds, we take cuttings and, you know, we nurture our crops knowing they need time and water and food and um, they need all these conditions to thrive. And I, I think the whole food system is, is a bit like um, that, you know, we, we sort of see the representation of what we wish for. We see lots of examples of the possibilities and that it can happen that we can share with others, we can feed others, and we can provide habitat for other organisms. And I guess it is that hope that keeps, you know, all of us optimistic. It might be good for each of, each of you just to comment on that, you know, like how optimistic are you that we can make um, real changes? <laughs> <laughs> Who's going first? Well, I mean, if you're a half uh, cup, you know, half full type person, then one's optimistic because you have to be because what's mm. the alternative so plenty of things to be miserable about but I remain optimistic yeah and how about you Manu you're actively making things happen you know how optimistic are you that our urban systems or smaller scale market gardens can be leading the way here I really believe in the power of people yeah <laughs> uh, I believe that if we connect small scale enough that we create an interdependent system of small, it can become extremely powerful. Think of the internet. Think of all of the decentralized um, systems that we've created. I, I believe that there is definitely a lot of hope. Uh, this is how our young people function now. They don't want to own cars. They want to car share. They don't want to own toys for their children. They want to have a toy 
for a couple, rent a toy for a couple of months and then put it back into a pool to share with other people. We, we are transitioning already to a different type of thinking. Yeah. Um, and, and it's really, um, a question of, of, of time before we've shifted to that kind of different way of operating. So how are you feeling? Are you optimistic? Look, some may say that I'm never not optimistic. Yeah, that's, true. Uh, <laughs> that's true. But but I think there's there's always there's always hope because I'm always associating and connecting with youth and they they aren't going to carry the baggage that currently exists because their their capacity to be informed and to understand the situation is incredible these days because of the the, the technology and the dissemination of information. I, I did a recent project where we 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 put out to to, to junior landcare to young children to to go out into their garden, into their street during during the lockdown, and tell us what they're seeing and tell us about the environment near them. And they just didn't take pictures. They spoke about biodiversity. They spoke about the importance of the ecosystem with with a clarity and a focus that for some of these children that were primary school would would have blown most adults out of the park so as much and all as as you know there's there's stereotypical sort of like oh well this is a new generation that's locked up in their in their technology and their their tablets and their this and that no i i see the exact opposite i see the potential for them to be informed, to be very mobile and active in their capacity to build momentum. And you're seeing that happen around the world, but I see it out on the ground in, in the school gardens and in the communities that I visit. I think we have a, a generation that, that is, is ready, willing and able to change. And, and our opportunity is to, to provide not only information, but the freedom, the backing and the support for them to step forth and and be that change and to drive that change without without the fear and without the the, the kind of historical baggage that the current generation carries around certain things. So yes, I, I see I see great hope. I see hope in the small things because the small things are the ones that grow the change. Whether you're talking about something of a scale of farm it forward, whether you talk about uh, the scale of of of, of ur- urban ed- edible garden um, visits and and open days and things like that, the more information we can share, the more we can get it in front of people, the more people hear the language of regeneration. That's the word. Looking forward to me, it's regeneration. It's a it's a generation, and they are the regeneration. They're, they're a generation that can regenerate the planet. And I think it's exciting and um, it's what wakes me up every day. Oh, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all love your positivity, Costa. <laughs> and what about you, Menu? Did you have anything to add? Yeah, I do. I do, I do want to first concur 100% mm. with co- what Costa had said about our younger generation. So our, uh, not only our children, but our 20 something year old. Um, I work, you know, um, with a lot of them and I, I really urge our councils and our, all of our organizations, all the organizations that surround suburban, urban, peri-urban, regional in, environments to really provide support and guidance. So we were talking about before about the difference between, you know, that, that, that real problem when we hand it over to experts or so-called experts. It's really important for us to shift um, from, from thinking we need to be experts to realizing that we need to be guides on the side. Um, and, you know, I had a very, very important mentor of mine tell me something very important to me, which was that we need to be guides on the side, not sages on the stages. Um, it's very important 
to work with our younger generation um, and support them through this big shift because they already have the answers. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And um, Costa, anything you'd like to add to finish this off? I'm fortunate to, to work with, with children in lots of different capacities and one of those capacities is the work that I do with with Dirk Girl World and Get Grubby TV and 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 have this opportunity to thread to thread fascination about nature and the planet. And I suppose the thing I want to remind, you know, everyone, you know, in the inner West um, is don't don't allow overwhelm to ever take control because it's too easy to be overwhelmed and then allow the status quo to dig deeper. I think there is massive power in the little things because that keeps our heads up and our focus on the horizon and it, and it enables our capacity to ensure accountability in everyone and everything around us. So yeah, there's there's no time for overwhelm. It's more, it's if it it's a real time now for for observation, analysis, and taking things about what we do, and putting a really solid veneer of love into it. Because you know all the information's out there. What we need is is the love and the capacity to connect community to all of these decisions going forward and the inner west community has a lot going on and there's a lot of love in that place and and they've got a lot of power to 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 drive things to to new levels so so yeah um it's about the love i reckon i reckon you're right costa and i have to say thank you to all of you patrice menu and costa for your valuable insights and all the amazing work you do um, to make our food system more sustainable. So thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Emma. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Emma. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Stay with us for our ongoing program throughout the day. If you missed any of our program earlier today, go to the Footprints page on the Inner West Council website.